next question arises that uh, we have been dealing with the fermi's paradox from a long time now question is where is everybody without having any answers so do you think now we have a great chance to investigate and answer this question right well, first i should comment that the fermi paradox in my view is showing arrogance because you know when i met my wife um, she had a lot of friends that uh, expected the prince charming on a white horse to show up and make them a marriage proposal and it never happened and why should we assume that we are sufficiently interesting and unique for anyone to visit us uh, the message i got from doing astronomy for decades is that of modesty you know uh, the universe is so big we are so small we live for a short time we started our technologies only a century ago you know and that's very short time relative to the age of the universe um, i just think that we are left out there in the dark just like ants on a sidewalk and uh, when you walk down the street you don't pay special tribute to every ant so my expectation is we are probably not interesting enough for anyone to to pay attention to us and fermi's paradox is you know pretending that we are interesting but i don't think so and uh, with respect to why uh, you know they may be short lived so most of the civilizations that existed are dead by now the sun formed relatively late uh, most of the stars in the universe formed before the sun billions of years before so there are lots of civilizations that existed and are not around anymore now the the original approach for searching for them was radio signals but that's just like like uh, speaking on the phone you need your counterpart to be alive uh and that reduces the number of you know people you can speak with only those that are around uh and then um, uh if you wanted to speak on the phone with the mayan civilization or the mayan culture you wouldn't be able to do so because they're not around uh, but you can find evidence for them by having an archaeological dig and finding all the relics they left behind in the same way if we go to space and search for relics plastic bottles on the beach you know that indicate the civilization was around most of the time we find rocks but every now and then we'll see something artificial and we can tell that it's artificial by taking a, a close up photograph so my suggestion is to deploy uh cameras within the orbit of the earth around the sun so that when the next object comes along that looks like oumuamua that is very strange we have one of the cameras intercepting its path and taking a close up photo you know in a photo a picture is worth a thousand, thousand words. words that's what usually people say but in my case it's worth 66000 words because that's the number of words in my book uh, i wouldn't need to write the book if i had a photograph of this object showing that it's not a rock so i i'm very much in favor of getting more evidence but um, unfortunately a lot of my colleagues do not even allow a discussion on this possibility there is a taboo discussing this subject and i'm very uh unhappy about that uh, because i think you know it's a real it's not a speculation uh, that civilizations may exist elsewhere because we know that half of the stars like the sun have a planet like the earth uh roughly at the same separation so if you arrange for similar circumstances you might as well get the same outcome and i don't see why we should be special and unique whenever we assume that we are at the center of the universe or we are unique we were wrong uh we are not privileged in any way uh okay so so uh, next uh, related question is like uh, last year i think uh, uh, cia has uh, commented about some ufo phenomena like they said that these are still unidentified so it was it was uh, disclosed by some american newspaper that these are actually the ufos and not some other phenomena and now uh, and the american administration is also saying that okay yeah we we admit we acknowledge these are unknown objects in the sky so uh, is it true that the government is opening up and now maybe in our last lifetime we will have some, well it would uh, in yeah go ahead yeah uh, like we'll have some intelligent uh, life form uh, visible to us in our lifetime oh um, for the second question i'm pretty sure that if we do not block put blinders on our eyes if we say you know if we don't say like most of the community says uh, among scientists it's never aliens or give me extraordinary evidence but how can one give them extraordinary evidence if there is no funding for such a search if young people are bullied whenever they mention such a concept uh obviously if you step on the grass it will never grow you know 
And uh, my point is that it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, the current approach. So as long as we open our eyes and allow our telescopes to look for things that, are, that might be artificial and consider that on the table as a possibility, you know, when we search all objects that come from outside this, the solar system, um, we might find some plastic bottles there and message in a bottle. But uh, with respect to the UFO reports, you know, they're often associated with eyewitness testimonies or equipment that is rather old, decade old. So I'm not really obsessed with declassified documents from the Pentagon or any other source, uh, because I think what we should do is actually take the most modern state-of-the-art cameras and uh, audio sensors, place them in the locations from where the reports came. This would not be very expensive and just monitor for any unusual phenomena. And uh, instead of relying on testimonies, you know, and deciding whether to believe people or not, we can just do the experiment. You know, why, just like kids, you know, when adults tell kids, oh, you should know this and that, they don't listen. They just try themselves. And that's, you know, that is the healthy approach because then you can check if it's real or not. Now we have much better cameras than we had decades ago, and we can do a much better job. Okay. Uh, and now uh, we are going to have James Webb uh, in space uh, uh, this year itself. So uh, uh, I think you're placing a lot of money on that. Um, well, it would be helpful, but it has a narrow field of view. So to scan the sky uh, and find more interstellar objects, you need a broad view, something that surveys the sky. And there would be a, a new telescope coming into operation within less than three years called the Vera Rubin Observatory. And it could potentially, it will be so sensitive that it could find one uh, Oumuamua-like object every month or so. And of course, that would be fantastic because uh, then we can uh, intercept some of these objects, uh, whichever look uh, unusual. I mean, the comets we're not interested in, but the things that uh, look artificial, we should uh, examine and take photographs and learn what they mean. So I'm, I'm very excited about the future as long as we allow ourselves to discuss this openly. And I don't see why not. I mean, there is the literature about uh, science fiction and so forth. But, you know, in the dark ages, in the middle ages, there were people arguing that the human body should not be dissected, should not, there should not be an operation because it has magical powers, because there is a soul. And imagine if scientists were to say, we don't want to discuss the human body because there are all these nonsense, nonsense said about it. Where would modern medicine be? So yes. I think it's an obligation of science to clear up topics that they are misconstructed by, the, by, by other people rather than to avoid dis discussing them altogether, which is the current situation. Yeah, so, so I, I was actually uh, reading some articles and uh, many of them say that we should have overwhelming evidence and we should have repeatable uh, yeah. experiments, then only we should uh, claim such things. So uh, then, then there is every kind of language being used for the scientists who are willing to take risks. So uh, how do you well, handle such, uh, such people, such criticism? Yeah, so I discuss it actually in my book, the, the issue of extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Well, my, my statement is extraordinary conservatism uh, leads to extraordinary ignorance, okay? And my point is, when you see anomalies, and by the way, these anomalies of Oumuamua were discovered by telescopes in the standard scientific method. And they were clear. They were beyond any reasonable doubt. Now, the question is of the, how to interpret them. So, okay, let's discuss what are the possible explanations. And some people in the scientific literature suggested maybe it's a hydrogen iceberg so that you don't see the cometary tail because hydrogen is transparent. The problem with that is that... Uh, hydrogen iceberg would not survive the journey. I showed that in, in a scientific paper after the follow-up. Mm -hmm. uh, then someone suggested maybe it's a cloud of dust, uh, you know, like a dust bunny that you find at home. But the, the problem I see is that when it gets close to the sun, such a thing will be heated to hundreds of degrees, would not survive. It doesn't have the material strength because they need it to be a hundred times less dense than air in order to be pushed by reflecting sunlight. So there were suggestions, they just don't make sense. And I leave everything on the table, whatever remains 
is the thing I like and, and, and adapt. And of course, I'm, we are limited by our imagination, of course, but we should keep on the table the artificial origin uh, so that we can check it. Otherwise, we just ignore future evidence. Just like the philosophers during the days of Galileo, they knew that the earth, that the earth is at the center and the sun moves around the earth. And uh, therefore, they didn't want to look through Galileo's telescope and they put him in house arrest. Now that only maintained their ignorance for a longer time and it didn't change reality. Reality doesn't care if we ignore it, the earth continued to move around the sun. So my point is, you know, we can be ignorant if you want. I mean, animals are ignorant, but in my, for me, the biggest pleasure I have in life is gaining knowledge and understanding reality better. I want to know who is in my neighborhood. Am I the, are we as uh, the human civilization, the smartest kid on the block? Uh, you know, when my daughters were young, they thought that they are the smartest. And, but when they went to the kindergarten, they got a better perspective. They saw other kids. And, you know, that the only way for our civilization to mature and not be so arrogant to think that we are alone is to find others. But, you know, if we don't allow any discussion on this, if we don't fund such a search. You know, there is a search for the dark matter in the universe. That's uh, most of the matter in the universe. We don't know what it is. And hundreds of millions of dollars were allocated to search for this type of particle or another part. Completely speculative. Nothing was found, only limits. Hundreds of millions of dollars. A factor of a thousand less funding for the search for technological signatures right now. Does it make any sense? I mean, it's not speculative. We know that half of the sun, like, uh, uh, stars have a planet the size of the Earth, roughly the same separation. So under similar circumstances, you get similar outcomes. So therefore, it, would, it should be a mainstream search. It should be something that everyone emb embraces rather than pushing to the sidelines. But at the same time, you have concepts like extra dimensions, the multiverse, string theory that have no experimental validation, but they offer a, a sandbox of fancy mathematics that allows people to show that they are smart. And that's why these are part of the mainstream. So I, I see myself with this scientific culture in, that instead of like basketball coaches say, instead of keeping eyes on the ball, in this case, the evidence, they keep their eyes on the audience. Uh, we need to keep our eyes on the ball, on evidence. We should reward young people that discuss evidence rather than do uh, intellectual gymnastics to impress us that, that they are smart. You know, that's not really what we are after. Yeah, so th th that's an irony because uh, the, uh, theoretical physicist uh, 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 whose articles I, I read, so he's very sure about multiverse. So he, he says that, okay, before Big Bang, there was something and uh, there is inflation and there are multiple universes and, and uh, those kind of things. He's discussing a lot about that. But he's not ready to discuss that Oumuamua has this scientific explanation. It could be somebody. So maybe your book doesn't say that it is aliens. It, it says that we should be open to uh, that argument that it, it could be them. So I yeah, think and, it can, and it can be tested because we can send cameras that will take photographs of the next object that shows up, right? So it's a testable prediction. However, with the multiverse, I, I, I haven't seen yet an article that suggests a test that would rule it out. It's really about putting skin in the game, you see. Yeah. Uh, many of these people that advocate the string theory, they don't make a prediction that can be proven wrong. If you ask them, make a prediction, let's test it empirically, and I want you to admit that you were wrong if it doesn't agree with the experiment. They would never do that. No. People that talk about the multiverse, extra yeah. dimensions, about the uh, string theory, about you know, so the only thing that made predictions was supersymmetry. It was tested experimentally by the Large Hadron Collider and nothing was found. So now they say, okay, the, the original proposal, you know, has to be modified. The, the natural set of parameters may be uh, off, maybe. Yeah. So the point of the matter is, unless you put skin in the game, you should not be rewarded. And unfortunately, there is this culture and, you know, there are also religious cults. You know, there are people that can convince each other that what they are doing is the right thing and they can get a high status within their community. They can get honors, awards and so forth. But is this really physics? I mean, yeah. it, you know, it, my point is your obligation as a physicist is to describe nature. 
not to show that you are smart. It's a dialogue. It's not a monologue. Right. Exactly. Uh, so uh, we uh, then actually uh, Indian audience is, is, is very much interested in having uh, some more exposure to this kind of concepts, uh, this kind of uh, literature that uh, you are bringing now, extraterrestrial, the new book that you are bringing. So uh, I hope your publisher also provides it to India, Indian audience at a uh, nominal price so that a lot of my friends can also buy it and, and read it. So Yes, uh, it's already out. Uh, there is a UK v- version, but I will send a message to my publisher uh, to make sure that it's available in India and uh, uh, it, it's, it will be distributed in more than 20 countries worldwide. There is a huge interest. Within just a few days after it came out, um, it rose to number seven in the New York Times bestseller list and uh, between Michelle and Barack Obama. I was really surprised. This is my first popular level book and there is a huge response. In the New York Times, there was a favorable review about it and now today there was also an op-ed about it um, saying aliens must be out there. Great. So there is clearly a lot of support among young people. And, you know, the current scientific culture, I was asked by the BBC just an hour ago, uh, I had an interview and was asked, uh, uh, how do I envision the change in, this, in the cu- current culture? And I said, you know, I, I don't have a lot of hope from the senior people that benefit from the current culture because they, you know, they are, they would not change it if they benefit from it. And the situation is similar to Marie Antoinette, uh, you know, during the French uh, Revolution, you know, she asked, uh, she didn't really understand the public and she asked, okay, if they don't have bread, uh, you know, they could eat cakes. And uh, the solution in that case was the guillotine. So I really have my hopes with the younger generation, uh, once they get to become uh, tenured professors without prejudice, without any baggage and, and with an open mind to innovate take risks and understand nature. You know, it's fun. I I basically follow my childhood curiosity. It's a great privilege to be a scientist because you can just figure things out and you can be wrong. That's not a problem. You know, we're trying, it's a learning experience. And I very much hope the younger generation would carry the torch of physics forward. Sure, Abhi. So uh, I think with that, we'll close this uh, uh, discussion. Any last words you want to uh, say to India? Um, That... uh, Many of my closest collaborators are from India. I just finished a a textbook of more than a thousand pages that will come out in June 2021, just in about half a year, um, about uh, the search for both intelligent and primitive life. Uh, We very much, uh, and that was written with my former postdoc uh, who came from India, uh, Manasvi Lingam, and uh, this uh, book, I very much hope, will uh, establish the foundation for the scientific search uh, that I hope will become a major frontier within the mainstream of astronomy in the future. And um, I also have a close collaborator named uh, Hamsa Padmanaban that we are writing many papers together. I would say that there is a huge talent in India, intellectual talent, uh, and I very much hope uh, that uh, more kids would aspire to become scientists. And I, I think uh, uh, that, that would make my day if people read my book and decide to pursue science as a result. Great, Avi. So it was a pleasure uh, for us to have you uh, today. Wishing uh, a lot of good luck to you and to your book. Thank you so much. I, I had a wonderful time uh, speaking with you. Yeah, same here. Thank you.